Welcome to PwC IFRS Talks, your source of all things IFRS, technical accounting matters, business issues, current standard setting and regulatory updates. I'm your host, Ruth Preedy. In today's session, we're going to have a slightly more lighthearted uh, IFRS updates, um, and that is to celebrate the life and times of Mr. Tony DeBell, who is sadly retiring from PwC on the 30th of June. So obviously, my guest is, we, we couldn't have anyone but him, but welcome Tony DeBell. Thank you. Last time in the studio, Tony, you must be crying Indeed. on the inside. I miss it, Ruth. <laughs> Good. We could do some in retirement. We could do it on cricket or football or something like that. And there'd be no restrictions on what I say. <laughs> exactly. Are you saying we restrict what you say? Come on. These are all your own views. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we are obviously our listeners are interested in you, but also IFRS. So we're going to keep it accounting topical. But first of all, tell us I don't even know this how long have you worked at PwC forever? And uh, how did you end up in technical accounting? So I've been around since September 1982. Wow. It's going to be about 38 years when I walk out of the door for the last time. I arrived in technical accounting towards the end of 2000. So that's about 20 years ago. And I arrived because I was looking for a change. I'd been an auditor for 16, 17, 18 years um, at that stage, apart from the 18 months I spent working with some of the PwC network firms in East Africa in connection with a local merger. And I figured it was time to do something different. I'd always enjoyed the technical aspects of auditing at major clients and technical accounting seemed like a good fit for a few years. Now here I am calling it a day after what I think has been 20 years in technical accounting and 14 years leading the revenue and liabilities team. Wow, no wonder your brain's so big. 20 years of technical accounting experience. And in those 20 years, what is your favorite accounting standard and why? One of my favorite questions. So uh, 20 years explains the gray hair, I guess. Um, what's, <laughs> no my, <one> can see. <laughs> what's my favorite standard? I think I'd have to say it's IFRS 15 because I was in at the start, talking to the IASB staff from the very beginning when they divided themselves into the space cadets and the dinosaurs, depending on whether they thought revenue was recognized when an entity did something or recognized when an entity transferred something. I was part of the process that developed the PwC response to discussion papers and exposure drafts and part of the team that wrote the PwC guidance. And I think the final product, the final outcome was a big step forward. It's given us a principles-based model that can be applied to revenue in pretty much every situation. And it also means I can say consistently to anyone that will listen, nothing is ever free. You just have to allocate the consideration properly. <laughs> I guess I couldn't let this question pass without mentioning IAS 12 and income taxes. Yeah, that's what I thought was going to be your answer. I think the standard gets an unreasonably bad press simply because some folks argue that uh, deferred tax liability might not meet the definition of a liability. My sense is the problem with the standard is it has had so many minor amendments and it contains so many exceptions that it's become a bit of a camel. I think if the exceptions and unnecessary rules were taken out and we fell back on the underlying principles with perhaps a couple of tweaks and maybe some better information about cash taxes, we would all be a great deal better off. So, yeah, I'll get in a plug for IS12. <laughs> in your retirement, you could sit at home writing letters into the IFRIC to get them to amend things. <laughs> oh, I love those. I love those letters coming from like individuals. That could be you, Tony. So I think you said there you joined in 1982. So over that time, what is the proudest thing that you've uh, done in your career? If you can name one, <laughs> two. I mean, that's a difficult question because there are so many things that we do as part of PwC that make us proud. Uh, and never more so than the things that the firm, partners in the firm, staff in the firm have done in response to the events of the last uh, two or three months. I think that's made me uh, very proud to be a partner in PwC. Uh, thinking particularly about what I've done, there are a couple of things that stand out. Firstly, I think I've always tried to do the right thing. And in the context of what I've been doing for the last 14 or 15 years in technical accounting, that's trying to work with people both 
inside and outside the firm to get to an answer that provides useful information, reflects the substance of the transaction, and remains consistent with the relevant accounting standard. I don't suppose for a minute that I always got it right, but I tried to get it right. And I never forgot that you can't ignore the words in the standard simply because they're inconvenient. The second thing, particularly relevant to what I've been doing in technical accounting, is just being part of the PwC technical accounting network, the way that we've worked together as a global organization and the way that we've supported our engagement teams and supported our clients and supported the cause of principle-based accounting. Brilliant. So much to be proud of, I'm sure. And one of those things you didn't mention, but you must be, was your time on the IFRIC. So you were an IFRIC member as well. What's one of the juiciest topics you debated on the IFRIC? Oh, I have lots to choose from, I guess. <laughs> so six years and four and what, or six Some issues went year. on for six years, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, some didn't get finished. Uh, <laughs> although there were, in fact, only two interpretations that were issued during my six years. The thing that I'm most pleased about, and this is not quite answering your question, but it's still the thing that I'm most pleased about, is the way the committee evolved over the time that I was part of it. A lot of the credit for that is down to the work of Sue Lloyd, Henry Reese, and Petrina Buchanan. And my sense is that the committee became more responsive, became more useful to its constituents, and its processes became more efficient. For example, we stopped playing issue tennis with the board, and the educational material and agenda decisions has been much more helpful to the preparers and users of financial statements. If I had to identify a couple of topics specifically, my sense is that the committee's provided some very useful guidance and structure on the way you should think through the accounting requirements of the new revenue and leasing standards. And we did this, and the committee continues to do it, in agenda decisions that have been issued to support the implementation of the new guidance. Yeah, I definitely love the latest AFRIC agenda decisions and their new structure. And we mentioned it there, you probably had some that drifted on. <laughs> Was there some that didn't come to a conclusion? I think you said um, two there. There were, there were a couple of things that I think drifted on is a, is a, is a good way of putting it, and on and on. And, <laughs> and although the process, as I say, I think the process got a lot more efficient, we didn't less time playing playing issue tennis. There are a few things that have been around for a while. One that comes to mind, although I don't think we talked about it during my tenure, was um, written puts on non-controlling interests. Mm. That remains an open question. Uh, when I think about the time that I was on the committee, there's a question about recognizing revenue over time in a particular set of circumstances that affect it's the real estate industry where the committee has issued an agenda decision that I'm comfortable with, that I think captures the guidance in IFRS 15 exactly. But I'm aware that not everybody sees that the same way. And I have a sneaking suspicion that might be back in front of the committee at some stage. <laughs> and I think for those people that have worked with you, you've coached over the years. One of the things I love about you is you're so logical. Like you'll think through a standard and I think, how do you make this standard so logical? When I read it, it's not that easy. What would be your advice to people listening about if you've got a new accounting chat, you know, topic or, you know, thing that you're challenged with? How do you make it so logical? How do you think through it? So I think the key is, is in the way you ask the question. It's important to work through the transaction, to work through the question you've got logically. The first thing I do is make sure I properly understand the transaction. What's going on? Why is it going on? And then I make sure I understand the scope. It's surprising how many times I've wondered whether the question I've been asked is the question that should be asked or whether the standard that's been identified is is the right standard. Now, obviously, you think of financial instruments people, they'll find derivatives everywhere. I'll probably <laughs> find a share-based payment in lots of places. I think these days more and more people find leases where they don't expect more insurance contracts. But once you've decided that you understand the question and you're in the right standard, I always say the next thing is to think, what does the standard require? I think I said just now, it's the words that the board wrote that matter, not what they meant to write, mm -hmm. not what I might wish they'd written, but what they actually wrote. And it, it, it's then working through those words to think, well, OK, what do those words require for this transaction? I also think about whether I've seen the question before. Is there precedent? Is there something internally? Is there something that the committee's talked about? Is there something that had been published by other accounting firms or regulators? Make sure there are no other angles that I need to think through. I also have a step when I've done all my research and analysis 
And that's to ask myself whether the answer provides useful information about the transaction. It will users of the financial statements understand. Does it make sense? If the answer is perhaps not, then it's time to have another think. Are there any alternatives? But always on the basis that the answer has to comply with the standard. The last thing is that it's always important to get other views. Listening to what other people have to say, listening to other perspectives is, is one of the most important aspects of the job. Brilliant. And then another thing we do, obviously, rather than just answer technical accounting questions, we'll do a review of a set of financial statements. If you had like a killer question or something you always look out for when you do a financial statement review, what would it be? Now, reviewing financial statements is one of the things I'm probably not going to miss. <laughs> so nice. If I had to summarize the way I think about doing a, a review, I would say I look for clarity, consistency and specificity. And the killer question is, do I understand the financial statements? Are they clear? Are they internally consistent? And do they provide useful information about the entity rather than being boilerplate or vague or repeating the standards? I ask myself whether they tell the entity's story. So I'll always say to somebody who's, who's helping me with a review, the first thing to do is take a step back. Do you understand the business from the financial statements? Do the financial statements make sense? Are the disclosures entity specific about accounting policies, transactions, judgments, risks, and uncertainties? Because if they are, that's gonna help me figure out whether the underlying accounting is consistent with the standards. So I really want to know whether the financial statements tell the company's story in a way that's easy for people to understand. So do I understand them? Yeah, I mean, a lot of those messages actually you said there is something that, you know, over the last month or so, we've recorded lots of COVID podcasts and it's always been about telling the story and disclosing and yep. being clear. So yep. definitely comes out a lot from everyone. OK, so over your career, probably in accounting technical, what's been the single biggest change you've seen in standard setting? I think the single biggest change is is, is in the approach to standard setting. Clearly, there have been a lot of new standards, insurance contracts, leases, revenue, financial instruments. Go back to when I started, we didn't have a share-based payment standard. So there have been a lot of individual topics, and I said I thought the revenue standard was a good standard and so on. But I think the biggest change is around the process and the way the standard setters engage. I think they are now much more inclusive. They do a much better job of considering alternative views, debating them comprehensively. I think they are open and they balance the different perspectives, not to the extent that it diminishes quality, but to the extent that there's a much better chance of considering all of the angles. And so I think this means that the quality of the standards that have been issued over the time I've been doing this job has improved significantly. Brilliant. And I'm hoping you'll miss something, not financial statement reviews, but what will you most miss while you're in retirement? Well, I think if you go back to the beginning, that was obvious. It will be coming on IFRS Talks podcasts. Oh, Tony, but, don't make um, me cry. Perhaps more seriously, <laughs> uh, I've just greatly enjoyed the people that I've worked with within the firm and outside the firm, whether it's with the standard setters, other firms, regulators, clients, whoever it is. I've just enjoyed working with the people. And so I think in the end, it's all about the people, really. Definitely. And I'm sure all those people want to keep in touch with you. So you turn your phone off if you don't want to keep in touch with them. They'll all be texting. So and what's next? Every, everyone I've worked with that has retired, Tony, I've worked with a few, all, all say they're going to retire and then end up getting another job or doing something different because they love working so much. What are you going to do? I don't have a clear plan. This is probably the one question you've asked me that I don't really know the answer to. It's obviously a slightly unusual time to be retiring, given given everything that's going on in the world at the moment. But right now, I, I don't have a clear plan. I always had the idea of taking a little bit of time off, watch cricket and so forth. No cricket going on at the moment. So yeah, at the moment, I don't really have a clear plan. Yeah, cricket and travel, your two favourite things are a bit tricky at the moment you'll have to save mm -hmm. those up for another time perfect well thank you tony it's lovely to hear all all about what you've been up to over the last you know x number of years and thank you for being a star of many ifrs talks you've been with us lots and explaining everything in such a clear way we're definitely going to miss you 
Well, I've got your phone number. <laughs> you can't get away. <laughs> and to our listeners, thank you very much for listening. Stay safe and happy accounting. The preceding programme was brought to you by Price Waterhouse Coopers LLP. This content is for general information purposes and is not a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.